we're finally at the point in our course where we can uncover some truths about what linear algebra is. In the next set of videos, we're going to look at two important questions. The first, what is it that makes vectors vectors? What are the mathematical properties that they have that make them things that we can study with linear algebra? And then secondly, what makes a function a linear transformation? So what kinds of functions can we study in linear algebra that push vectors around? And perhaps most importantly for us right now, how do we design a matrix in order to accomplish the work of those functions? So what does this all look like? First of all, what is it that makes a vector a vector? So in order to say that an object is a vector in mathematics, what properties must it satisfy? Well, first and foremost, vectors are defined by their ability to add to other vectors. So we can study vectors if we can study objects that can combine with other vectors in their space by addition suitably defined. Likewise, vectors are also defined by their capability to be multiplied by scalars. We think of often scalars as being real numbers, but really scalars can be numbers that come from any number of field um, that we can study even more abstractly. But for us, it's almost always real numbers. So vectors are characterized by their ability to combine with other vectors by addition and to combine with scalars by multiplication. One thing that generally we can't do with vectors is we can't necessarily multiply vectors one by another, for example. So there's some arithmetic that vectors are necessarily capable of doing, and there's other arithmetic that they aren't necessarily capable of doing. Now we can multiply vectors in some other settings. So in abstract algebra we study things called algebras, weirdly enough, um, and in an algebra we can multiply a vector by a vector. Um, but those really aren't our objects of study in our course here. It turns out that just having addition and scalar multiplication gives us plenty to work with. So the way that a mathematician then defines what a vector space is, is by saying that it's a set V, and the elements of that set we're going to call vectors. And that set is endowed with two operations, an addition operation, which adds two vectors together and gives me a vector, and a multiplication operation, which combines a scalar, a real number for us, with a vector and produces another vector. And that set, combined with those operations, is called a vector space, as long as those operations satisfy some reasonable conditions that make them sort of qualify as being addition and as being scalar multiplication. And so in a traditional linear algebra textbook, what you'll see is this laundry list of different vector space axioms. Um, and depending on you know, your professor, I suppose, you might have to verify a bunch of these things. Uh, but what you'll find out when you read down the list is a lot of these just kind of sound like common sense. And the reason they sound like common sense is that most often the addition and scalar multiplication that we deal with in linear algebra is just built on top of the addition and scalar multiplication of the real numbers. Uh, and the arithmetic of the real numbers satisfy all these axioms and more. So it's not too surprising uh, that these are what they are, but what they give us the power to do is also recognize operations elsewhere, which we may not think of as addition or scalar multiplication in the first place, but which we might, if it, they satisfy these axioms, we can nevertheless use linear algebra to study them. So what are some examples? The most familiar kinds of examples to a student of linear algebra are the examples that come just from the Euclidean plane, R2. So if you think of the elements of this set as being ordered pairs x, y, where x and y are real numbers, and then we define what it means to add two of these ordered pairs. We just add them by components. x1, y1 plus x2, y2 is the sum of the x1s and then the sum of the y's. And we define scalar multiplication similarly in a component-wise fashion xy times the scalar c is just going to be cx cy. So this is the conventional way of defining the xy plane, if you like, um, using the arithmetic that just comes naturally if we think about ordered pairs. And that set is a vector space. It's probably the most interesting, familiar vector space that we can study in linear algebra, and certainly we spend a lot of our time studying the properties of vectors in that space. We could extend that, of course. It didn't matter that we were only in two dimensions. We could extend this up to n dimensions just by making n tuples of real numbers instead of ordered pairs. And the arithmetic and scalar multiplication are defined in the same way, uh, and that forms a vector space as well. But there is a lot more in heaven and earth than is dreamt of in the Euclidean spaces Rn. Here's an example of something that might not seem like a vector space in the beginning. It's called P2, and we call it the set of quadratic polynomial functions. So it's defined as the set of functions that take the form ax squared plus bx plus c, 
where a, b, and c are chosen from among the real numbers. So we think of this as the set of all functions which are up to quadratic. They're functions that take a real number as input, they output a real number as output, but they are not themselves real numbers, they're functions. So the elements in the set are not usually what we think of as being points in a space or something like that, but what we'll find out is that this set, combined with the arithmetic that comes naturally, will also satisfy the axioms of a vector space, and therefore we can use linear algebra to study it. So how does the arithmetic work? Well, it works how you think it would work. If I have two of these polynomial functions and I want to add them together, then I add them together by combining their like terms. a1x squared plus b1x plus c1 plus a2x squared plus b2x plus c2. Just combine the like terms so that a1 adds to a2 in the coefficient of x squared, b1 adds to b2 in the coefficient of x, c1 adds to c2 in the constants. And likewise, to multiply one of these functions by a scalar, a real number, we'll just distribute that multiplication so that it multiplies each of the coefficients. So the arithmetic here is, again, the arithmetic that would come naturally to us from having studied functions in algebra uh, once upon a time. And we can check, I'm not going to do it here, that this set satisfies all 10 of these vector space axioms as well. And so this set of all quadratic functions from R to R satisfies the axioms of a vector space. So what's exciting about that is it means that we can use all of the tools of linear algebra not just to study vectors in the points in the xy plane, for example. We can also use linear algebra to study polynomial functions. And in a couple of videos, we're going to see a really surprising connection uh, that we can use linear algebra to do calculus on these functions, which is really exciting. Here's one more example before we wrap up this video. We can think of the set of 100 by 100 pixel digital images as a vector space. And this is super exciting, too, because what it'll mean, hopefully, is we can use linear algebra to study how digital images are stored and processed by a computer. This is actually one of the most common uses of linear algebra in technology. So how does it work? Well, if I have a 100 by 100 pixel image, uh, then a computer will typically store that as what's called a pixel map. It's not the most efficient way to store an image, but it's a good first approximation for us. So the way that that works is that we assign to each pixel in this image grid, so it goes 100 across and 100 down, we assign to each of those pixels a number that tells us how bright that pixel is. So we're going to think of this as just being a black and white image for right now. And the higher the number that we put here, the brighter the pixel. So if I have something that's kind of a medium gray, maybe I'll give it a number like 127. If I have something that's dark, I might give it 0. If I have something that's totally bright, I might give it a high number like 255. So we give each of the pixels in this grid a number. And the brighter, the higher the number, the brighter the pixel. And when we store all 100 times 100, all 10,000 of those numbers, then we've stored a pixel map of this digital image as, if you like, a vector in 100, uh, sorry, in one 10,000 dimensional uh, Euclidean space, because we've assigned each one of these a number. So the elements in this space behave just like their elements in R10,000. And what that means is that then if we define the arithmetic, uh, like the addition and the scalar multiplication, in the way that would come naturally on R10,000, then what we get is also a vector space. And so that's super exciting because it means that we can use all the tools of linear algebra to also study how digital images are stored, processed, and understood. So that's really cool. What we've just found out is that what it is that makes vectors vectors is not their membership in some magical geometric space, like two-dimensional space or three-dimensional space, but rather what makes them vectors are the properties which define the arithmetic that they're capable of doing. And that arithmetic is limited to addition with other vectors and multiplication by scalars. And any system in which we can say that those two operations are well-defined according to these 10 axioms is a vector space and something that we can study using linear algebra.